Well, let's get going here. It's uh, 11 o'clock. Uh, so project number three, um, I basically completed all the grading, but I'm waiting to hear back uh, from one student on a particular project. So that's why you, uh, I, that's why I have not emailed you back the projects yet. Uh, well, hopefully I will in the next few days. Uh, project number four, we are going to discuss during class today. Uh, we will discuss it right at the beginning, one part of it, and then we will discuss project number four again at the end of class once we've covered some more material that's uh, needed for the project. Are there any questions before we get going here? Okay, so let's take a look at the project. There's two problems on it. We're going to talk about problem number one first. Problem number one lets you work with the cheese data once again. Uh, part A relies on some stuff that we're going to do in Chapter 9, so I'm not going to discuss that right now. But Part B, you have enough background uh, now to complete. And so, you know, what we found in the last project was that, you know, perhaps the lactic, um, the, the acidic acid, uh, was maybe a variable that we don't want to include in our model. And so let's consider a situation where we just have hydrogen sulfide and lactic, lactic acid in our model to predict the response. Then what I'd like you to do is some stuff similar to what we did at the beginning of Chapter 8. First of all, perform a hypothesis test to determine if the model should include an interaction term between the two variables. Okay. Uh, part 2, perform one hypothesis test to determine if the model should include the interaction term along with two quadratic terms as well. So we're looking to see first order versus second order model, essentially. Part three, uh, for the model with only the hydrogen sulfide and lactic acid linear terms within it, look at residual plots. Um, a plot of the residuals versus hydrogen sulfide and apply the residuals versus lactic acid. From that, well, does it suggest that a quadratic term is needed for any of the variables? And so what this is going to allow you to do is kind of relate your uh, answer that says part I there. It should be part I, I, so two I's. Relate your answer to part two when we were examining an actual hypothesis test to make that same kind of determination. And then lastly, plot the first and second order models in three dimensions. We looked at how to do that last time. And relate your answer to uh, part one and part two, both. So in other words, you know, just again, we're looking at some graphics in the third and the fourth part there uh, in order to see what the hypothesis test is showing you. So it's just helping you see, uh, you know, just to visualize, you know, does it make sense to have the quadratic terms? Does it make sense to have the interaction terms? Um, you know, sometimes you lose track of that when you're only performing a hypothesis test. So uh, this allows you to actually see if, if it makes sense or not. Okay. So problem number two, we will discuss towards the end of, end of class. We need some more background material first before you can do it. So you can put away the project for now, and let's get to page 824. All right. Are there any questions, though? Okay. Page 824. So we're going to talk about qualitative predictors. So far, for most of this class, we've been focusing on quantitative variables as predictor variables meaning, for example, height measured in, in inches. That's a quantitative variable. We looked at, for example, high school GPA. We looked at minutes per game in the NBA guard data set. Those are all quantitative variables. You know, generally speaking, they're measured on a continuous scale, and there's an order to the actual variable values. So a GPA at 3.0 is lower than a GPA at 3.1, obviously. This section allows us now to incorporate qualitative variables, or you can say categorical variables, 
as predictor variables in our model. So for example, uh, gender, male or female. You know, there's not necessarily a numerical value there. Um, uh, political party affiliation. There's not necessarily a numerical value that you can assign to, let's say, Republican, Democrat, Independent, Libertarian, or whatever other parties that there are out there. So how can we now include this qualitative, this categorical variable in a regression model? Because, you know, you would think that, you know, these kinds of variables could be helpful to predict the response at times, depending upon the situation. And the way that we do that, the way that we include these variables in a model, is to use what are called indicator variables. Some people also call these dummy variables. I like the word indicator because dummy is kind of a negative, negative connotation to it. So indicator variables. And what these simply are, are basically variables that have values of 0 or 1. That's it. Um, for example, with gender. How about we let x be equal to 1 for female, 0 for male. If I wanted to, I could reverse that as well. 0 for female, 1 for, female, uh, 1 for male. It doesn't matter. All this is doing is indicating, thus indicator variable, indicating if you have a female or male. That's it. And it allows you to do it numerically so that we can include these variables then in our like X matrix and do all our math with them. Now notice here that this obviously gender has two levels to it. But it only took one indicator variable to represent it because this indicator variable has unique levels for the two levels of gender. Now you might be thinking, well, geez, that's obvious. But Later on, when we have qualitative variables that have more than two levels, then it's sometimes, at least at first, not necessary. Uh, it might not necessarily make, uh, I should say, make sense. It's not necessarily obvious that this is how you would construct indicator variables. So, more on that later on. So, you know, let's say that we have some kind of response. Why? Maybe it's GPA. Maybe it's some other variable. And we're looking at how does this response vary as a function of gender. The way that we can quantify, quantify that variation is through a simple regression model. Expected value of y is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1 times x. Now look what happens when x is equal to 0, meaning you have male. This beta, I'm sorry, this x is 0. So then that means beta 1 times 0 is 0. And you're left with just beta 0. So what you would expect y to be on average is beta 0. Since these are males, then you can say mu sub m, let's say, mu for mean, m for male, mu sub m is equal to beta 0, the mean of the males. If x is equal to 1 for female, look what happens. You put a 1 in here, and now you just get beta 1 there in addition to the beta 0. And so now you have the expected value of y is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1. Let's call that mu sub f, or mean female. And so you see how, with these two levels for this qualitative variable, each has a unique representation now in our model. Also notice, what we could do is, and you know, you learned about this in your very first stat course, Often you're interested in this. HO mu F minus mu M is equal to zero. So the difference in means hypothesis tests. Well, what's mu F minus mu M in the context of our regression model? Well, it's beta zero plus beta one minus beta zero, or just beta one itself. That's it. So if I were to do a hypothesis test then for beta 1 is equal to 0 versus 9 equals 0, let's say do a t-test, I will get exactly the same result as if you were to do a regular old hypothesis test for the difference of two means that you learned about in your first stack course. Very, tests are equivalent. <laughs> now, let's relate this problem also to something that some of you have had. Um, 
definitely if you've had STAT-802, you've talked about ANOVA models in a completely randomized design. If you had STAT-801, depending on your instructor, I know I would, I, I teach this, uh, we also talked about uh, ANOVA models in a completely randomized design. I'm not going to ask you a question on a test about that, but since I know most of you should have seen this before, that's why I'm going to actually mention this. Now, you may be more used to seeing a model of this form. Expected value of y is equal to mu plus alpha sub i, where i is equal to 1 or 2 in this kind of a situation. Mu is often referred to as the grand mean. Does that sound familiar to some people? And alpha i is the treatment effect for level i. Well, let's think of it as the gender effect for either male or female. For identifiability purposes, often you will let one of these alphas be equal to zero. There's other ways to handle that identifiability problem, but often you let set one levels of alpha to be zero. Let's let alpha one be equal to zero. And notice what we have then. For males, expected value of y is equal to the grand mean. For females, expected value of y is equal to the grand mean plus alpha two, the effect of female. So essentially, though, we have exactly the same model. You know, let beta 0 be mu, let beta 1 be alpha 2, you have the same model. And the reason why I like to bring this up is the fact that ANOVA models are just a special case of a regression model. That's it. Sometimes it's hard for students to understand, uh, and I'll talk from my own experience as a student, that really wasn't really related to me when I was taking courses like this. But an ANOVA model is just a special case of a regression model a regression model that has qualitative predictor variables. Okay? So that means all the stuff that you've done in like a STAT 802 course or, my, or in an 801 course, depending upon you know, what you talked about, all that stuff can be doing the, done in the context of our regression models. Okay? Let's look at political party affiliation then. Let's say there's just three levels, Republican, Democrat, and Independent, just to make things simple. Now, how would I include, let's say, political party affiliation in a regression model? There's three levels of this qualitative variable, and it's going to take just two indicator variables. So now notice how, again, just like with gender, it takes one less indicator variable than the number of levels of your qualitative variable itself. So what I could do is set x1 to be, let's say, 1 for Republican, and then 0 otherwise, meaning Democrat or Independent. Set x2, a second indicator variable, to be 1 for Democrat, 0 otherwise. Okay? Here's a summary of what has happened. Notice how each of the levels of political party affiliation has a unique coding to it amongst the indicator variables. Even though I'm just using two indicator variables, I have a unique coding for three levels of a qualitative variable. This is why I can get away with one less indicator variable than the number of levels. If I wanted to, I could have, you know, defined this also as maybe, maybe put independent here instead. I could have done that if I wanted to. I will get exactly the same, when I actually estimate the model, I will get exactly the same predictive values. I will get exactly the same hypothesis test overall results that you'll see coming up that judge the importance of this qualitative variable. Exactly the same. What do you think is going to happen to your betas? Will they be the same? I'm sorry. What happens to your, let, let's think of it as this way. What's going to happen to your Bs, your estimated betas? Are they going to be exactly the same if I had the model where X1 was equal to Republican or if I had the model where X1 was equal to Independent? Yeah, things, it will be different. It will be different. But that's okay. It doesn't matter. No big deal. Because, again, 
your predicted values will always be the same, and also your hypothesis test overall results will always be the same. So it doesn't matter what the, what the coding is, you're still going to get the same overall results. You'll see examples of that. So here's my model. If I had just a simple model, maybe Y is just some kind of response. Now I'm interested in how the expected value of Y varies as a function of political party affiliation. So I said expected value of Y is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1 times x1 plus beta 2 times x2. And again, notice how each, I have this on page 827, notice how each level of political party affiliation has a unique representation in the model. What would happen if beta 1 and beta 2 were equal to 0? What would that say about political party affiliation and its effect on the response? It has no effect. So what we could do is do a test like this to determine if this qualitative variable has an effect on the response. Again, if beta 1 and beta 2 was equal to 0, look what happens. Expected value of y is equal to beta 0 for all the different levels. In other words, the means are the same. So in an ANOVA context, you know, you might have seen something like this in another class. where you're testing equality of the means, that test is equivalent to the test in terms of the betas. Same test. Just written out different. That's all. How would we do this particular test here? Well, the overall F test. You remember that from Chapter 7. Hopefully you remember that. But notice here, we would not want to do individual t-tests on the particular uh, indicator variables. So we would, want, not, we would not want to do this. In this case, it would be two different tests two different t-tests, we would not want to do that particular kind of test. Generally speaking, <laughs> you would not want to do this kind of test. Because if we're interested in overall, does political party affiliation have an effect, then it would not make sense to do two tests to make that determination. Just do the one test. What you might be interested in is uh, uh, doing a, a further comparison. Once you make a, an overall determination, then do a further comparison. We'll have examples of that. Where essentially what you would be doing is something like this, essentially. Now, in general, if you have a qualitative variable with C different levels to it, form C minus 1 indicator variables, just like what I shown in the previous two examples. You would, still, you would need three in order to get a unique coding. So, for example, uh, let's, if there's any libertarians in here, maybe you'll like this. We're going to give you some, uh, some I guess, extra uh, publicity. That's how you would code it for a four level. Notice how there's there's unique codings for each, and you need actual three indicator variables to make that happen.
If you just only use two, you couldn't get that. One one is still unique. Excuse me? One one is still unique. What do you mean by one one? It's x one equals one, x two equals one. But but what how would you differentiate between independent and libertarian? So what you're saying is this essentially, if I'm understanding you correctly, you say this. No. Um, which one's one and one? The answer is no, and that is because they essentially are equal across the different levels. And so that's what's going to cause you the problem. And, you know, this is, you know, an example, too, where, you know, in this class, I'll give you enough background now that, you know, you could try this on your own. Actually try to estimate a model like this and see what happens. And you, you're going to have R come back with errors. Okay, so let's take a look at this example. Uh, this is car highway miles per gallon, or involves car highway miles per gallon. Um, there's a number of car data sets out there that are, are classical data sets that uh, uh, people like to use in statistics. And actually now a few years ago, I actually went to the Department of Energy's website and actually uh, downloaded uh, all their information that they have on cars and their miles per gallon along with various other characteristics about the cars. In particular, um, what's listed there is the class of the car meaning like uh, compact, subcompact, mini-compact. Um, I didn't use any trucks or anything like that. I, I excluded those. Uh, a large car, a mid-sized car, and so on. And in fact, if you look throughout here, and actually it's listed on page 828, there are seven different levels to the class of the car. So how about we use the class of the car to estimate the corresponding miles per gallon. Because you would expect, for example, smaller cars, depending upon other factors too, but smaller cars would typically have better gas mileage on average compared to larger cars, because larger cars weigh more. Um, but of course, you know, there are other factors that could affect uh, the uh, miles per gallon in terms of well, what kind of engine do they have, what's the size, what kind of transmission they have. Um, how many cylinders are in the engine, and what's the number of gears of speeds for the engine as well. Um, and all, and if this semester, almost, I almost uh, instead of using the cheese data set, I was going to actually have you go to the Department of Energy's website and actually download the data, because it's all there, and actually use that throughout the semester for, for our main data set that we use, but I decided to just use cheese instead. So... Anyway, so, so this data is in an Excel file, so I read it in like usual. Um, so, for example, the first car here is a compact, um, and it gets 25 miles per gallon on the highway. And whenever you have data like this that, uh, you know, you have a, well, whenever you have a new data set, you know, typically what you want to do is maybe do some plots of the data to help better understand it. And so... You know, back in chapter one, we learned to do a scatter plot. You know, plot the response versus the predictor variable. And that will help you see relationships. But obviously, we can't do that when we have a qualitative variable, though. You know, what's going to be on your x-axis? You know, these, this qualitative variable is, has categorical levels to it. So what one can do then, in this case, is do a box plot and a dot plot. We've talked about box and dot plots starting back in Chapter 3. So essentially what I did was I took that code and actually I made some small modifications to it that we'll see in a, in a second here. And I did our box and dot plot. And this is what it looks like. This is on page 829. I actually decided to overlay the dot plot on top of the box plot. This is helpful in terms of instead of having one plot to look at, you have two plots to look at. I'm sorry. Instead of having two plots to look at, you just have one plot to look at. So on the y-axis, we have miles per gallon. 
and the x-axis, we have now the class of the car where it's represented by the different categories. So we see, for example, with compact cars, miles per gallon, maybe the lowest was 19, highest was about 49. Now, if I was looking to determine if there was differences amongst the uh, different classes of the cars, differences in terms of miles per gallon, what would I look at for this kind of a plot? What would I be looking for? What aspect of this plot would allow me to say, yeah, there might be differences amongst the miles per gallon for these types of cars? Yeah, I mean, you could look at 25, uh, the, the, the 25th quant, uh, percentile, 75th percentile, you can look at the median. But if you think of it from, from a bigger point of view, what you're actually, and, and, and then, sorry, I'm getting tongue-tied today. You would compare these quantiles across the different classes. If they are a lot different, then you might be thinking, oh, there's some differences in the miles per gallon. But essentially what you're doing is looking for shifts in the distribution. So for example here, look at subcompact and two-seater. Notice how the two-seater, its distribution is mainly between here and here. But subcompact, while there's an overlap in some of the points with two-seater, you see some of them are a lot higher. In other words, the distribution is kind of shifted for subcompact when compared to two-seater then that might make you think, hmm, maybe there's something going on here. Maybe subcompacts sub on average have better miles per gallon than the two-seater. And then using a regression model, we can actually test that. So how did I do this plot then? Well, I used the function that we looked at, we used before, but some, with some modifications. So box plot. And here's one of the modifications. You can actually use a formula argument in the box plot function, just like what we do with the LM function. Say formula equal, what do you want on your y-axis? Tilde, what goes on the x-axis? The other change from how we did this in chapter 3, or use this function in chapter 3, is I use an argument called PARS. PARS stands for graphics parameters essentially, not parameters in, in a statistical sense. And this uh, little argument value basically says is for the outer plotting points or plotting characters, do not plot them. In other words, anything beyond the fences, so here's a fence and here's a fence, anything beyond the fences, don't draw any plotting points. The reason why I said that to R was because now I'm going to come with a uh, dot plot and actually overlay points on top of the dot, uh, on top of the box plot. So now for my x argument of dot plot, unfortunately there's not a formula argument. I say car data dollar sign mpg tilde car data dollar sign class. I say add equal true, so add it to the current plot. And now you can still see those outliers that were beyond the fences. So it's a nice, a nice graphical summary here. Um, I really like these kinds of plots because it gives you, uh, allows you to see the actual observations, but it also gives you the nice aspects of a box plot, like where the median is, where's the percentiles, what's an outlier, and so on. Any questions about this plot? Well, here's some summary statistics. For those of you who are familiar with SAS, you know, you're familiar often, or you should be familiar with uh, the by statement in SAS. It allows you to implement the same kind of procedure by a certain characteristic of the data. Well, the kind of the equivalent here in R is to use what's called the aggregate function. So if I say aggregate formula equal, 
MPG. I'm going to summarize MPG by classes. And how am I going to summarize it with the function mean? So what I just did here was let's find the mean of MPG by class. Remember how I pointed out subcompact versus two-seater? Notice how two-seater has a lot lower um, sample mean than a subcompact does. And we, again, saw that basically. We can kind of visualize that in the plot, why that happens. So at least with respect to the sample means, we see some differences. Now, of course, then the question is, well, are these differences enough to say, yes, indeed, subcompacts have a different, let's say, population mean than a two-seater? We could also use the aggregate function with the standard deviation function. Let's again focus on subcompact and two-seater. Notice how subcompact does have a larger standard deviation than two-seater. Why does that make sense? Well, look at how subcompact has more variability than two-seater. We see that visually. We see that visually. I don't know if I needed to say it that way. We see it. Okay. Any questions? Well, now let's estimate a model that uses class as a predictor variable represented by six indicator variables to predict um, uh, MPG. So again, I can use the LM function like before. And as you might expect, I can say formula equal MPG tilde class. I summarize the results that are now in mod.fit, and this is what I get. So what R does, it automatically creates the indicator variables for you. You do not need to create them yourselves. So that's nice. And in order to figure out, well, what are the actual indicator variables that are created, you know, look in your usual coefficients table. Here is B0, B1, all the way down to B6. Notice R uses the word class to correspond to the qualitative variable. And then right after it, it puts one of the levels of class, large. So what this is representing then, this is representing, let's call this X1. X1 is equal to 1 for a large class of a car. It's equal to 0 otherwise. For, mid, for class mid-size, for that row, that output, mid, uh, x2, let's say, x2 is equal to 1 for a mid-size car, 0 other ones. Yeah? What's the class compact? That's a good question. Remember, we only needed 6 indicator variables represent seven levels of our qualitative variable. So what R decided to do was to use then compact as the, let's say, all zero level of class. Essentially, yes. So this, uh, to you, you can use the, the function called contrast in R if you Again, had a STAT 802 course, the term contrast should sound familiar, and you can think of it that way as well, even though we're not necessarily contrasting stuff here. And if I say contrast car.data dollar sign class, you can see how R chose to do the coding. So it created a variable essentially called large to represent the, the class equal large. So notice it's equal to a 1 for a large, 0 otherwise. It created a variable called midsize to represent the level midsize, 0 otherwise. The compact class of a car does not have any indicator variables for it. It's not needed. So that's why you don't see compact then in the output. 
Here's then this just broken down in terms of maybe a little bit more readable table. People often refer to, in this case, in the compact level of class as the uh, reference category or the base level. Why? Well, essentially what we're doing, and we can see this better with, or we can see this maybe more easier with the political party example. In this case, let me do some erasing here. In this case, independent is the reference category or the uh, base level because all comparisons are going to be basically made with this form of a model back to independent. So if I look at beta 1 here, this is essentially the difference between Republicans and independents. Beta 2 is essentially uh, the difference between Democrat and Independent. So that's why Independent will be the base category. In the context then of our example here, then all of our comparisons then that we're making is actually back to the compact category. So this B1 is essentially comparing large to compact. by how we write out our model. So here's what the actual model looks like if I were to write it all out in terms of y's and x's. I think a more descriptive way to write it out is like this. So MPG hat is equal to B0 minus B1 times the indicator variable that we're going to call large, and so on. Again, you don't see compact. In there. So let's uh, look at some questions here. Is class of the car linearly related to MPG? Yes or no? It is. Why? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, what? Okay, p-value for the F-test. Remember what the F-test is doing. It gives you an overall measure. Is there at least one beta not equal to zero? I have a very small p-value here. So yes, their class does have an effect on MPG. Or in essence here, there's a difference in the population means between the classes. I don't know where that difference is. If it's between all the classes or maybe just two classes themselves. But I know that there's a difference. What's the estimated uh, uh, MPG for compact cars here? Thirty point seven three. Because all I need to do is put in zeros for all the indicator variables. I got the estimate of MPG for compact. What's the estimated MPG for two seaters? Twenty five point one. How did I find that? Well, this is a zero, this is a zero. All of them are zeros except for this one. It's a one. So I just take 30.73 minus 5.6. And this also then helps you see how essentially what this 5.6 is representing, it's a comparison between two-seaters and compacts. Is everyone clear on that? Because that's a very important point. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Like we, are, we, are, we are trying to understand the impact of the difference. Well, this B is representing basically the mean difference. Again, 
30.73 is for compact. 25.1 is for two-seaters. If you take the difference, what do you get? 5.6. So in essence, what we're doing is these Bs are all comparisons of means from, the, the, let's say, the level of interest of the class of the car to compact cars. Which car gets the worst gas mileage? Two-seater. So, you know, what do I do here? Well, I simply look for, are there any negative Bs? And there are. And then find which one is the, let's say, the lowest overall. And it happens to be two-seater. Here's something that's also interesting. Let me do a split screen. Remember this output that we got previously that looked at the sample mean for each of the classifications? Or I'm sorry, for each of the uh, classes of the car. Well, look at the, the two means that we just found for compact, or the two predicted values that we got for compact and two-seaters. Look at that. They're exactly the same. That makes some intuitive sense. Because all we're doing is using the class of the car to try to predict what the MPG is. Use the mean. And that's what ends up happening with this model. Suppose I had a, um, another predictor variable in my model that was continuous. Would the same kind of thing happen? No, because you know, everything's dependent upon what's the value of this other predictor variable. But in a simple model like this, and this is why I chose a simple model like this to begin with, um, we see this, you know, what's intuitive you know, happens. But there are going to be situations where, again, you have a more complex model and you need to, let's say, come up with predicted values, your Y hats, let's say, or MPG hats, uh, based upon a particular class of your car or, you know, uh, or other predictor variables. And how can you do that? How can you come up with the Y hat? Well, just go back to what we did before. Use the predict function. So in this case, I can say predict object equal mod.fit, new data equal Create a data frame that has what you're trying to predict at. Notice how I include class equal, and I have to put into quotes, I have to put into quotes the actual level of the predictor variable. Again, put it into quotes. And then I could say se.fit true interval. Maybe I want a confidence interval, 95%. And this is what I get. Here's my confidence interval. So with 95% confidence, the mean MPG, miles per gallon, is going to be between 29.8 about and 31.7 with 95% confidence. Remember that this is the variance, I'm sorry, this is the square root of the estimated variance of y hat. How was this interval formed? I'm just using the usual formula we've seen before. And again, notice how this is just simply the sample mean for the compact cars. So now you might be wondering, well, what if you simply just applied the stuff that you learned in your very first stack course to find a confidence interval for regular old population mean? Where we only use, let's say, the compact cars, their miles per gallon, and form the usual old T distribution interval. So, you know, in that setting, what would you have done? You would have said something like this. Um, 
y bar plus or minus the value for my t distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom times the sample standard deviation divided by the square root of n. That should look familiar. So let's see what would happen if we did that. First of all, how could I just simply pull out the compact cars from my data set? So let me get my data into R. Okay. So in my car data, this is what it looks like. And if I just wanted my, the, the MPG, I could just simply say dollar sign MPG, as we've done many times before. But how about if I want to know well, which cars correspond to compact? This is how I could find it. Let me move this up a little bit. So I say car.data dollar sign compact, and then I do a logical comparison. I say equal, equal, compact. Yes, you have to use two equal signs. We might have done stuff like this before. I, I don't remember. Excuse me? Shouldn't that be plus equal, equal, compact? Yeah, that's right. Thank you. Car data dollar sign class equal, equal, compact. And look what I get. Well, let me ask you, what happens when I hit enter here? Get trues and falses. Okay. So notice the first one's true, second one's true. And let's just do the head on that, just to show you that indeed the first two are compact. Notice how also R actually shows you what the levels are. And so, if I have trues and falses there, what I can do is then combine that with MPG. So now by putting those brackets in there, I can specify particular uh, cars that I want out. The ones that are trues are going to be pulled out. The ones that are falses are going to be left in the data set, you could say. And those are only my compact cars in miles per gallon. Any questions? Okay. Um, so I put that in an object called mpg.compact. And then I use the t.test function to help me find a a regular old confidence interval for population mean. We looked at this function actually once before. This was our introduction to our section that we did during chapter one. And here is my confidence interval. Notice it's not exactly the same. Why is it exactly the same as what we got from our, our model? What's different? I have the two formulas up there. What's different? Is it just too obvious and you just don't want to speak up because it's right in front of you? Different degrees of freedom. And also look at what we you know, use for that square root of the estimated variance. You know, compare that here from our model to this right here. Those two values will be different. In fact, I show you that they are different on page 834. So that's why we get a, you know, a different result here. But, you know, it's very similar. So what's then the advantage of using this regression model? Well, there's a few different advantages rather than just simply using what you learned in your first stack course. And that is, it allows you to analyze uh, you know, other classes of the cars. And actually allows you to make comparisons of the cars all within the context of one model. That's why this is, uh, uh, this is the better approach. 
well, when it's possible. Also, even though I don't do this right now, it'll, this kind of model allows you to incorporate other predictive variables as well. So I can incorporate transmission. I can incorporate cylinders if I wanted to and still do this kind of a comparison here where if you use the basic stuff from your first stack course, you're not going to be able to do that. That's why, when it's possible, use a regression model to make comparisons like this. Okay, let's look at some specific comparisons between the different classes of the cars. Suppose you want to compare the mean of a compact car to the mean of a large. So in the context of our model, this is what we would get. So the beta 1 is the very, very important part. So if you take the subtract the 2 means, you get beta 1 in the context of our model. So if I were to do a, a t test for beta 1 is equal to 0 versus beta 1 does not equal 0, I do this hypothesis test, the difference of the two means. So now this now is the particular case where you would want to go back to your output and check the corresponding p-value. Notice where I'm going here. We're testing beta 1. Is it equal to 0 or not? So of course I go to that corresponding row in my output for b1. Here's b1, the standard error, the t-test statistic. And there's my p-value. So is there a difference between difference in mean MPG for compact versus large? Yes. Now, I would not have done this comparison. I would not have done this comparison if I wouldn't have first have the overall test tell me, indeed, there is sufficient evidence that there's at least some, uh, some effect of class on MPG, but there's some difference in the means. Excuse me? It's not a control. No, it's just our reference category. It's our base level, you could say. But it's not, you know, what people would say in, let's say, in a clinical trial setting, a control. We are making comparisons to it, yes, but it's not like, a, you know, often a control in an actual experimental setting is where you don't apply treatment at all. That's not the case here. And also, like, uh, it's not, it, 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 yes, they don't do. Like, the beta zero is the overall mean. Yeah. Right? And here is the compact. Well, it's, it's, well, it depends upon how you incorporate, then, the indicator variable in your model. That's, that's the difference. And so it all goes back to you know, what I was referring to right here. Once you incorporate restrictions on your parameters, and, it, and I'm talking to AO2 context, once you incorporate restrictions on your parameters, that mu is not the overall grand mean. Okay? Rather, it becomes basically, if, if we're doing these kinds of restrictions where we're letting alpha 1 be equal to 0, rather it becomes basically the interceptor, which then would be, um, you know, like in our case, the compact carbon. Now, there are other kinds of restrictions that maybe you talked about in 802, such as if you let the sum of the alpha i's be equal to 0 then that changes your interpretation of what mu is. Does that help? Yeah. <coughs> okay. Ah, unfortunately, I just removed my split and I, I, I needed it. Let's go back to the output. Okay. Actually, I want to go back to the plot. So, you know, do, does our, 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 our 
result here makes sense when we're comparing the mean of large to mean of compact. Look at the plot. Are you surprised by our results? Look at the plot. No. Because look at, again, there's this kind of differences in the distribution. And we can see how all larges are kind of low, where compact really spreads out a lot. And you can even look at the medians, how you know, they're somewhat different there. So the results that we get here are not surprising. And this is always a good check to make sure that you know, you're doing this, you know, you're, you're getting the numerical results correct. Try to always relate stuff back to a plot. Think about, does this really make sense based upon what I saw? Yes, it does. Um, let's take a look at now some of these other p-values here. So what does, let me get out a different color here so we can see it better. What is this p-value testing? Well, it's in the mid-size row, so you think, oh, something's dealing with mid-size. Well, you're close. Let's be careful not call it a probability. This is a p-value. Um, it's comparing mid-size to compact, the reference group. Okay. So is there sufficient evidence to indicate that the mean for compact is different from the mean of mid-size? Yes or no? Yes, because the p-value is small. In a similar manner, many compact to compact, yeah, there's evidence of a difference. Ooh, but look at station wagon. Not sufficient evidence to indicate a difference. Same thing for subcompact. Two-seaters are different from compact. Okay. Well, what if, though, you want to make some other kind of comparisons that do not include compact? How do you do it? Or maybe just give up and say, ah, oh, it can't be done. Yes, it can be done. Because remember, you know, this coding, these indicator variable codings kind of somewhat are arbitrary. You know, this is what R shows as the coding. Um, I think that reminds me too. I don't think I mentioned why did R choose this as the ordering? Or I'm sorry, why did R choose this as the um, uh, the coding for the indicator variables? Did I mention that? I apologize. Um, let me go ahead and do that. Sometimes I need to make sure I look at my notes before I go off on, on certain topics and to make sure that I cover everything. Okay, so page 831, this is where I did show you this is what R chose, but I didn't tell you why R chose this, and that's important, especially if you're used to using some other software package, because another software package might use a different coding for the indicator variables. What R simply does by default, it puts the, your category levels in alphabetical order, or let's say if you have maybe categories of 1, 2, 3, and so on, it will put them in a numerical order. Uh, the ones will actually come before the, the, the alphabetical letters. Or the, two, the numbers come before alphabetical letters. Um, so it puts everything in alphabetical order, let's say. And always the first category, in this case compact, becomes the reference category or base category. By default, this is how R does its coding. If you're familiar with SAS, do you know what SAS does? Doesn't do the same. It's always the last level. It puts everything into alphabetical order again, but it uses the last level. So in this case, two-seater would be the reference category. And our, I'm sorry, SAS would form then the indicator variables like this. That's how SAS would do it. So if you estimate this model with R, 
And if you estimate this model with SATs, we get the exactly, will the model look the same? No, the Bs will be different. So don't get frustrated when you can't duplicate your results. Well, I'll just say it. Don't get frustrated thinking that SAS was incorrect. SAS is actually correct. They just have a different coding for the indicator variables. Okay? Again, you'll still get the same predicted values. You're still going to get the same hypothesis test results, even if you coded it that way. Okay, now let's go back to where we were. Sorry again. But let's say that we want to change what the, what the base category, what the reference category is, so that we can actually make other comparisons. How could we do that in R? Use, there's a few different ways. Here's the easiest. Use the re-level function. Re standing for reference level. So it's, I call it re-level, but you can think of it as reference level. Set a reference level. Excuse me. And this is how you can do it. So we say re-level. The first argument's just simply called x. Put in your, your qualitative variable. And then say, I want my new base level or reference level to be, how about we say large, the large cars. And notice what I do here. I put the results immediately back into car.data, and I simply say dollar sign class. So essentially what's happening here, the previous way that class was organized is going to be written over by this new way. So the previous class variable is going to be replaced by this one. It doesn't change the data in any way. It only changes how R recognizes the ordering of the, of the, of the, the levels. That's it. So we can actually then see what the ordering is by using the levels function. Now, large comes first. And so large is going to be always the reference or base level. I can re-estimate my model using the exact same code as before. And this is what I get. Let me do a split screen one more time. Maybe I should just stop removing the split screen. So here's the output that we had before with the default. And now with, with a, re, uh, a changing of the base categories, this is the output that we get here as well. The Bs are different. But, again, you'll still get the same hypothesis test overall results. So notice that F test statistic. And notice that F test statistic exactly the same. But what we see in the output in the middle here is that you see different Bs and you see different P values. That's because different comparisons are being made. So in the bottom set of output, what's actually being compared? Or what, what's that P value testing? Compact to large. Actually, that's a bad comparison. Uh, I shouldn't have brought that one up at first. This is exactly the same. <laughs> yes, there is a there is a, a, a problem with tablet PCs. If I have mentioned this before, that's existed since tablet PCs came out in 2002. And that is when you um, do a split screen in Word, and if I make a mark up here, and our mark down here, it, it disappears. I might have to get out an old-fashioned laser pointer and point there. But we see the p-values are exactly the same because it's the same comparison. However, notice how the b's are different, just the reverse of the signs. Because the top one is essentially comparing mu for large minus mu for compact. The bottom one is doing mu for compact minus mu for large. Let's take a look at another one. Get a better color too. So 
So what, what's that p-value then testing? Mid-size versus large. Okay. So we have some moderate evidence of a difference in means. Since the p-value is kind of small, but not real small. And so that's how you could then test other sets of means, pairs of means. Question? Yeah. Is that possible, like, you know, to avoid, like, the intake set? Like, no Excuse intake, me? Like, no intake set in our model, is that possible? You could actually remove the intercept. And we've actually talked about that once uh, before, by um, removing the intercept. And you can put, there's a few different ways to do it. You can put, for example, a negative 1 at the very end of your formula argument, and that would remove the intercept. And what would you see in this particular case? What you would see is seven different indicator variables, and each of the Bs would be equal to the sample means. Perhaps you saw that in an 802 kind of course. And that is the compact would appear, right? Compact would appear, yes. Yep, yeah, just try it yourself and you can see that. Okay. Now, so that's one way that you could do other comparisons. Obviously, you'll be limited to, um, you know, whatever you set the reference category to be or the base, base level to be. But... A more general way to do these kinds of comparisons is this, to use what's called the multi-comp package in R. This is not installed by default. You would have to actually download it. Multi-comp stands for multiple comparisons. Again, if you've had an 802 kind of setting, or I know I would say this in my 801 course, you know, what we're doing is multiple comparisons of means. That's where this terminology comes from. So this is how it works. First of all, I say, you know, library, molt comp. And then let's say that I want to do a large versus mid-size comparison with my, original, uh, with my original model. So, again, that original model was expected value of y is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1 times large plus beta 2 times mid-size plus beta 3 times whatever. Okay? So my original model before I used the re-level function. So if I want to compare large to mid-size, what am I doing here? I am comparing basically beta 1 to beta 2. In other words, the mean difference between the two is ah, beta 1 minus beta 2, right? That's going to give me mu large minus mu midsize. So let's put this in a matrix context. Here's beta 0, here's beta 1, beta 2, down to beta 6. There's a vector of my betas. And if I want this to be beta 1 minus beta 2, what would I need over here for a vector? Zero, one, minus one, zero, 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 zero. Multiply the two together, you get beta one minus beta two. This is a contrast. So again, for those of you who have had 802, this should look familiar. This is a contrast. If you don't have, never had, have, have not had 802, never heard that terminology, that's fine. No big deal. I'm not going to use that terminology on the test. So I can now set up a matrix in R, which essentially, again, will be a vector, a 1 by 7 vector, that gives me this, this set of zeros, ones, and negative ones. So I say matrix, or K gets a matrix, data equal. I combine together all my zeros and ones and negative ones. Number of rows of one, number of columns seven. Um, by row equal true doesn't really matter in this particular case. And then I use a function that's in the mult comp package called GLHT. Does anyone have an idea what that stands for? 
general linear hypothesis test. I specify where my regression model is in the model argument. And then I say where my contrasts are. The L-I-N-F-C-T stands for linear function. Because what you're doing is finding a linear function of your betas. I put the results into compare.means. You can look at compare.means. It gives you some information. But if I then do summary in compare.means, I get what we want, which is the hypothesis test. Is there a difference between the two means? So I say summary, compare.means, test equal, I'm going to say adjusted parentheses, quote, none, end quote. I'll explain what that means later. You might not get to, to, to today, but I will explain it later why I did that. And this is what we get. Here is B1 minus B2. You can look on your own. You can see that indeed that is B1 minus B2. Here is the square root, the estimated variance of B1 minus B2. Here is a t-test statistic for B1 minus B2 over the square root, the estimated variance. If I use a t distribution approximation with n minus p degrees of freedom, I can get a p-value, I get 0 0.0284. So, again, moderate evidence of a difference between uh, large and mid-size. Where did we see that p-value before? Remember when I had Remember when I was using large as the reference or base category so I could do a comparison with midsize? There you go. Same test. Just a different way to do it. A more general way. What if I wanted to do maybe more than one test at the same time? So let's uh, compare... Um, we'll still do the large versus midsize, but how about if I went large versus compact? And remember in the context of our model, B1 is the difference between large and uh, compact. So how do I get that? I just need to take the correct linear combination of my betas. So in other words, I just need beta 1. Now my K-matrix, I say I have two rows, seven columns still, by row equal true, meaning that what I, the way that I've actually typed out, I want what's on top first in the first row and what's right below it in the second row. In Chapter 5, we talked about what happens if you don't do the by row equal true. The default is false. And the way that the matrix would be formed, it would be row 1, column 1, 0. Row 1, column I'm sorry, row 2, column 1 would be 1. So it would actually form this as the first two, first column, form this as the second column, and so on. We don't want that. So that's why I said by row equal true. Again, GLHT, summary. Here's the output. And, of course, we get the same as we got before. And look at this p-value right here. 3.25 times 10 to the negative fifth. Where did we see that in the past? Here's our output from our first model using compact as the base category. And you can see right there. There it is. Same test. Are there any questions? I thought that maybe we'd get a little bit farther than what we did, but that's okay. Um, what we will do next time is start off on page 837. Uh, we'll, we'll finish that page, finish page 838, and then I'm going to talk about problem number two on the project. Okay? But you pretty much have enough background now to complete all of problem number two. It's just unfortunately we just didn't have time to actually go over it in class. Are there any questions? Okay, that's it for today.